Professor Martoni, Excellencies, Distinguished Chairs, Presidents, Directors, Fellow Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to welcome you at the General Assembly of the fifth anniversary session of Budapest International Model United Nations. This is the final and most important stage of our conference and your work, and I believe that also the most prestigious. For these ends, it was my greatest pleasure to invite Professor Janos Martoni, who gladly accepted our request to address the General Assembly. Professor Janos Martoni is a Doctor of Law and Political Sciences, gained PhD in Law and uh, Political Sciences in 1979, politician, legal scholar, diplomat, attorney, and university professor. He was the Foreign Minister of Hungary between 1998 and 2002, and also 2010 to 2014. Since 1987, he has lectured at several universities, among them at the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences of Elte University, the Szeged University of Sciences, the College of Europe in Bruges, and the Netherlands also, and the Central European University. He is also an author of numerous articles and essays in the field of international economic and trade law, competition law, European integration, cooperation in Central Europe, geopolitics and global regulations. Professor Martoni has been decorated with Commander's Cross with the Star of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary, National Order of the Legion of Honor of France, Commanders and Officers rank, National Order of the Merit of France, as well as British, Austrian, Polish and Bulgarian state decoration. Professor, it is my utmost honor to invite you to the floor to address the 5th General Assembly of Budapest International Model United Nations. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, good friends. First and foremost, I have to apologize for the length uh, of my CV. Uh, I would have expected a much shorter one, but it was quite detailed. Uh, before everything, I also would like to express uh, how much I am honored and pleased uh, with this invitation and to have this opportunity to uh, talk to you uh, about probably the most important subject matters uh, which we are now facing in the world. Uh, I would try to summarize your thoughts, which I'm sure you discussed in the last couple of days. And uh, I will basically touch on two minor things. Uh, one is the world as such, and the other one is the earth. When we speak about the world, we primarily have in mind human activities. Man, mankind, humanity. When we speak about the earth, then, of course, primarily we focus upon the ecosystems and how can the Earth be saved. Uh, but in order not to be too serious, uh, with respect to the Earth and the present situation of the Earth, uh, I would uh, tell you a joke, which is not my joke. Uh, of course, jokes uh, have no copyrights. Uh, but this joke I heard uh, from one of the most eminent persons, especially in this area, Geoffrey Sachs. Uh, he told this joke just a couple of weeks ago at a conference. Now, the joke is the following. Uh, the husband and the wife, they go to see a doctor. Uh, there is a very thorough examination of the husband. And after that, <coughs> the doc uh, tells the wife, 
I'd like to talk to you, just the two of us. And then the doctor tells the wife that, uh, lady, I have to tell you quite frankly that your husband is very, very sick. It is very serious. Well, he may have one, one, two months, three months. But, but, if you decide to do everything for, 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 for him, uh, to pay attention to him day and night, uh, to comply with all his whims, whatever they are, you may bring him back uh, from this condition. Okay, so then the husband, he asks the wife, what did the dog say? You will die. So, uh, that's the pessimistic approach. But uh, we shouldn't forget the, 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 the first part of that, that there is a possibility, there is a chance uh, to bring the earth out of the present condition. So, after all, that is the final message of the joke, that this is our your and the next generation's uh, uh, responsibility. We can't decline responsibility. We are all in there. It all depends upon ourselves. It all depends upon human activities, aiming at making the world a better place and uh, aiming at saving the earth. Now, I think Many times in human history it was said that now this is a crucial epoch which is ahead of us. We are at crossroads. The uh, future of mankind will be decided in the upcoming years, decades and so on. Well, it has been said before. But uh, many people believe that uh, at the beginning of the 21st century uh, this uh, message uh, is uh, really uh, valid. You often hear, uh, for instance, the words that let's take a so-called 21st century approach. Let's approach this question in a 21st century manner. By this we want to express our negative judgment about the, what is sometimes called the short and horrible 20th century. And we try to say that, okay, the 21st century will be entirely different. Well. We have to be cautious. Do we know now at all what the 21st century will be? Did people know, uh, let's say in 1913, or even at the beginning of 1914, what the 20th century will be like? They could not anticipate World War I and World War II and uh, all the others uh, terrible things which happened, especially in the, or I would say rather in the first half of, uh, of, uh, of, of the 20th uh, century. So, what I'm uh, is saying is only that the uh, 21st century is basically ahead of us. It didn't start in the best possible manner. Uh, it started uh, with the explosion of a global financial crisis in 28 that turned uh, into a sovereign debt uh, crisis, especially in, in Europe, as you know. Then it turned into a general economic uh, recession. We are still a little bit at the end of. And even worse, of course, uh, uh, since, uh, uh, I'd say, 1945, uh, we uh, had the first uh, armed conflict uh, in Europe. Uh, well, some might say that some conflicts that happened before, that's true, uh, but the size uh, and the importance uh, of those conflicts, for instance, in Yugoslavia, uh, was completely uh, different. This time, uh, there was a serious violation 
of uh, the basic principles and rules of international law uh, committed by a permanent member of the Security Council and one of the two nuclear superpowers. That is serious. It is very, very serious. And we do not know yet what the outcome uh, will be and how things will be developed in the upcoming months, I would say. We have some guesses how things will develop in 10, 15 or 20 years, but we have very little idea what is going to happen in the upcoming weeks or months. Now, this is one of the basic features of our time, is that everything is unpredictable. We are living in an unpredictable and uncertain world. It is complex, it is interdependent, uh, everything is accelerating. You probably uh, learned or read about the famous butterfly effect. Some people now speak about butterfly defect, which means that we cannot predict, we cannot really forecast developments. We do forecast, by the way, everything. Especially economists, they forecast everything. They know exactly what the GDP of that or that country or region will be in 25 years. They measure now everything. We measure everything. But we should, for, uh, should not forget we cannot forecast and cannot measure everything because human nature is much more, much more complex. But that, of course, you all know. By the way, the situation now, I believe, because I'm, I'm still an incorrigible optimist, is immensely better than, for instance, the situation in 1913 or 14. In those times, you know very well, one of the basic reasons uh, of, uh, of uh, the war uh, was uh, human error, miscalculations on both sides. Now, this time, I believe that leaders, let's hope so, uh, they are no longer sleepwalkers, they are much more aware uh, of the risk and of uh, what is at stake in reality. Uh, so uh, I do believe that because of, uh, of, uh, of a certain degree of wisdom on the side of politicians and leaders, uh, this kind of sleepwalking, stumbling in a war uh, can uh, be hopefully uh, avoided. At the same time, uh, there uh, is a more complex feature here, if you compare the situation now, uh, as it existed 100 years ago. And this is uh, that uh, uh, human activity is now seriously influenced by what we call uh, the natural uh, phenomena, uh, natural uh, developments. We have uh, global risks which are uh, not primarily linked to human activity like terrorism, uh, war and so on, uh, but uh, they are inherent uh, in the uh, so-called limited nature uh, of the ecosystems. Uh, there are, as we all know, planetary boundaries. So whatever we want to do here uh, as human beings, we have to be aware uh, of uh, these uh, planetary boundaries and that's the big deal. Uh, that's the big game uh, for uh, the uh, 21st century. Uh, one of my conclusions, which I might anticipate now, uh, I hope not to forget it at the end, uh, is uh, uh, that on the one hand uh, we have here a huge opportunity, a huge opportunity of economic development, of economic uh, growth, primarily due to uh, technology, human knowledge. Uh, we uh, now have an opportunity uh, to uh, to uh, diminish, might maybe even eradicate poverty. 
We might even manage uh, to reduce inequality, which is one of the major risks of mankind now. We might even uh, give clean water uh, for billions of people who do not have it uh, now yet. So we have huge opportunities. We might even have a, a more peaceful world. We might even diminish uh, the risk and threat of armed conflicts um, by preventing them by, by, by negotiations, by dialogue, which you exercised yourself in the last couple of days. So there is a tremendous opportunity uh, before us. Uh, at the same time, if we cannot reconcile this economic growth and development and uh, the, uh, the realization of all these benefits inherent in economic and technological development, so if we cannot reconcile that with uh, the <clears throat> limited nature uh, of the ecosystems, uh, then of course uh, comes the joke I was trying to uh, tell you at the uh, beginning. So um, it's true uh, that uh, what many people have been trying to explain for decades uh, and decades uh, uh, is becoming uh, reality. Uh, no doubt uh, we need to have a completely uh, new uh, approach. Uh, climate change is here. Uh, not everybody believed it even a couple of years ago. Now it is a scientifically well proven uh, fact. Uh, and some people now say that, uh, that we are now entering uh, the so called new geological epoch, uh, which is called the Anthropocene. When did it start? There is an ongoing debate. Some people say it started with the Industrial Revolution uh, at the end of the 18th century. Some people say that it started uh, roughly 8,000 years ago with the beginning of agriculture. Uh, some people say that this started with Hiroshima in 45. So, okay, opinions diverge, but all in all it's quite clear uh, that uh, what the notion uh, means is that now human activities have a significant global impact uh, upon the Earth's uh, ecosystems. And the Earth, uh, as somebody said, started to send back uh, messages, signals. Some people say Earth started to send back uh, invoices, and we have to pay those invoices uh, if we want uh, that the Earth continues to deliver services uh, for eight or uh, nine uh, billion people. Now, the real problem is that uh, this so-called uh, natural phenomena, natural uh, processes, are very closely interlinked with human activities. Uh, some people say it's not proven, it's just an idea, uh, that uh, prior to the uh, Syrian uh, uh, civil war, there was a serious drought in the country. So there was a more acute water sh uh, shortage than otherwise. Some people say that uh, just before the Arab Spring exploded or started, uh, there was a serious price increase uh, of, uh, of, of grain, basically of food. Uh, so, uh, these uh, kind of human or economic elements uh, uh, can often trigger uh, developments which thereafter uh, cannot uh, be controlled. But on the other hand, of course, we know very well that climate change, if it goes on like that, would uh, bring about extremely serious political, economic and social consequences. Uh, one and a half billion people would probably have to leave the place where they now live. Uh, just imagine uh, the economic and political challenges uh, resulting uh, from this. Uh, roughly 20, 25 states, member states of United Nations uh, would cease to exist. How all these problems 
uh, economic, social, uh, institutional, legal, and so on, uh, could be could be resolved. So there are, of course, other global threats or risks. Uh, terrorism, I mentioned. Pandemia is also, of course, very serious. Inequality, that's uh, man-made, so-called self-afflicted uh, uh, risk or threat. Uh, nuclear war. You know, my generation, we were always afraid uh, in uh, the course all through the uh, Cold War, I mean, we were afraid of a nuclear catastrophe. Then in 89 and 90, basically we forgot about that. Nobody cared too much about this because uh, we all thought consciously or subconsciously that this is over. Okay, okay, we know very well that there are thousands and thousands of nuclear warheads around. Some countries are developing them. Uh, everybody is modernizing them, by the way, for the time being, spending billions and billions on nuclear uh, armaments. But still, they would never do it. I mean, th that would be a suicide, a collective suicide of mankind. So nobody would ever do it. Let's hope. Let's hope. So it's still a little bit back on our mind that we have to pay more attention, we have to pay more attention to CTB and many other things, because if the situation goes on like that, we might arrive at a point when some people, in some situations, might still uh, trigger uh, this uh, 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 process. So that's about uh, all the global risks and threats which will have to be tackled and handled. How? And who will do that? That's the basic question. We all know that there is need for a more effective and more efficient global governance. Very true. Who can be the global governor? We all know that there is no substitution, there is no genuine real substitution for the United Nations. Of course, we have very important, relevant, informal cooperations like G7 or G8 or G20 or G whatever, but uh, at the same time, we, we, we uh, know that in a, in a truly institutional and a legal sense, we only have United Nations, and that's why we should draw much, much more benefit from United Nations. And uh, I know very well that not everybody in the world is fully aware of this. But this is hard work to convince everybody, especially the most important guys, that United Nations is indispensable. And I think your work uh, makes a huge contribution uh, to this uh, understanding. That's very important. But even if United Nations, of course, <clears throat> Uh, has some difficulties because we know that global, global governance is not easy. We now have a civilizational pluralism, as it is sometimes said. The world is getting more and more fragmented. There is no such thing as a single world order, even some people say, uh, including Professor Kissinger, uh, because civilization is diverse, which is not bad, as long as we recognize and accept each other. Point number one. Point number two, it's no problem to have uh, a so-called civilizational pluralism. As long as we have some basic universal values which we all recognize and accept. The ancient Romans, they said, neminem ledere, don't hurt others. And that's all, that's simple. So if we accept some basic universal values, and we abide by them, then of course there is a hope to get out of the present uh, uh, very uh, risky uh, situation. And all that, of course, uh, depends upon, upon, upon you, I'm sorry to say. Uh, 
We need to have an international community. It's very often said. We need to have universal values for this international community. We need to have uh, an institutional system which may be progressively called uh, global governance. We may we, we, we need to have we need to have uh, global rules uh, which uh, regulate uh, human behavior, uh, human between human and humans uh, uh, and the nature. That's all true. But also we have to see clearly that uh, we are also responsible for uh, the uh, future uh, generations. Interesting that uh, when you think about developments which might happen in the economy or, 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 or science or technology or whatever, in uh, 40, 50 years, uh, some people might say, uh, why do you care? As you know very well, uh, Keynes, the famous economist, said that in the long run we are all dead, which is true. So why do you care? Because you will be no longer around. Interestingly, and this is a secret I will tell you, that the older you are, you care more about the future. It's very strange. And it's not because, uh, not only because, of course, most people have children or grandchildren and of course, those children and grandchildren will also have children and grandchildren. It's not that. It's not that. It's, it's much more general. You are a member of a community. And the community is to be interpreted not only in an international sense, which is already not so easy, as we all know, but we also have to interpret the word community in an intergenerational uh, 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 sense. We are subsequent generations, and we are all responsible we are all responsible for the, for the uh, next ones. So, coming back to the 21st century. Uh, after all, the 21st century uh, will be formed by, by us. How it will look like depends on us. Primarily, uh, primarily on you. And that's, of course, a huge responsibility. A tremendous responsibility uh, no one can avoid. And that needs uh, not only commitment, determination, uh, knowledge, hard work, but it also needs optimism. So despite all the risks and threats uh, I tried to uh, refer to and describe, maybe too much a little bit, I didn't want to frighten you. I wanted to give you optimism, because all those risks, threats, challenges, can be tackled, uh, can be managed, plus we have uh, another huge job to, to manage uh, the public goods, that is the positive side of the same exercise. It's not just negative to avert risks, but also to use the opportunities and to manage the public goods we are all responsible for. Now, this is a very easy job. I'm optimistic uh, you can resolve it. I also hope that this conference that you have had uh, has made a an important contribution to this. With that note, thank you very much.